going to be in First John as well as other places, but First John is probably First John chapter one. You know, while I was doing this message, I thought, and, and I don't have it in this message because it's a different, uh, a different uh, presentation, but uh, joy has tears with it many times. Um, we don't think of it that way a lot of times, but it does. I, I, I thought about that while I was doing that. I thought about that young guy that got saved at... 15 years old in a YDC, and, and I show up in a church in uh, Macon to preach, and uh, before I came here, uh, and um, there he sat on a pew. That'll bring tears of joy. 25 years later, he's 40 years old. John, uh, 1 John chapter 1 and ver verse 4, it says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Well, I don't know about you, but I want my joy to be full. I, I want all the joy I can get uh, from the Lord uh, in life. And in fact, um, that's really... Um, as you are being uh, part of the uh, church of the living God, that, that's part of where joy is, is in family, uh, our church family, and also our physical family. And those things we write unto you that you're, uh, and he, when he says you're, he's saying you as an individual and uh, exceeding uh, and, and as a group. In other words, uh, our joy, personal joy, ought to uh, fill over, full over and, uh, uh, to other people around us. And they ought to see the joy that we have and, and want some of that in their lives. Joy may be full of joy. Cheerfulness, exceeding joyfulness. Between friends, It would be full. We have joy full with our friends, our Christian friends. And, and it means to be infused completely with what Jesus is telling us. Uh, hold your finger where you are and go back to the Gospel of John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, I believe, yes, it is. John 16, uh, 24 and 25. It says, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Have you ever asked anything of God and and he provided it or took care of it for you and your joy was full because of it? Yeah. And that's a great verse. Verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, uh, figures of speech. But the time comes when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. You know, it's a great thing to know Jesus. It's a great thing to know the Father. It's a great thing to know that our joy comes from them. I remember in my prior life, before I was saved, it was a miserable life. Now, I thought I was having fun and having a good time, having joy, but I didn't know what joy was. And it was not. And so we see these things, and and we just praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7 to start with. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says this, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, uh, uh, before the world under our glory. Now go down to verse 11, I believe it is. 12. Verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us, uh, to us of God. Verse uh, 14, no, 13. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And what he's saying here is that when we uh, uh, come into fellowship with Christ and we start to receive of Him, we start to receive the pure Word and it's, um, and it's a joy to receive it. Now, some things in the Bible don't appear to be a joy because they're uh, difficult. Uh, we have difficulties in life and uh, we run up against things that, that uh, don't bring, bring joy at the moment. But afterwards they bring joy. Jesus Christ, it says of Him in, uh, in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before Him, He had just suffered uh, the uh, death on the cross and uh, here He was with joy in His heart because he could see in his mind, not the individuals, but the, but the millions of people who would come to him in salvation and have everlasting life and, and our, his joy would be our joy. And we'd be together in heaven. We have a lot to be joyful for. Verse 5 uh, of uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 uh, says this. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, darkness is sin and it's a, it uh, symbolizes sin. And there's no sin in Him. And isn't it a great thing for us to have that light? God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Light reveals truth and truth disposes of darkness. Every time you hear the light, the Word of God, uh, things in your life uh, take a different uh, viewpoint and um, you start to see how good God is and the things he's brought you through and the things he's going to lead you through in the future it's a, it's a great revelation light reveals truth and truth disposes of darkness the untruth to make verse 4 understandable we must believe that what God is saying is the complete truth. Now, you know, I believe this is the verbal plenary Word of God. Uh, it's the inerrant Word of God. It's the infallible Word of God because nothing with God can be anything but infallible and that's completely truthful. There's no anything that He's ever written or he's ever said to, uh, uh, to anyone that is not the complete truth. Uh, and he goes, uh, nothing hidden in his speaking to us believers. Darkness <coughs> represents obscurities. Light is from the word phos, P-H-O-S, as in phosphorus. Now, when I was in the service in the 60s, we used a lot of phosphorus bombs on the Vietnamese 
and the Cambodians and the Thais and others that were um, fighting against the Vietnamese government and uh, were not uh, uh, God's people. They had a God, but his name was Satan. He was not the God's uh, people. And light is light radiating from Jesus, but without burning heat. You know, the stuff that we shot out on the ground uh, had phosphorus in it. When they hit somebody, it stuck to them. There was a lot of cruel deaths in that war, and uh, on both sides. And it was, um, it was not good. Now, um, God's word, or God's phosphorus, God's heat, is without heat. His light, I mean, is without heat. Um, uh, it's uh, luminous, uh, outwardly and internally. Uh, when you receive Christ, you are lit up on the inside, and you have the spirit of truth living in you, and he reveals to you several things. The first thing he revealed to me was, uh, started to reveal to me is uh, sin in my life. I had sin in me and uh, I put my trust in Jesus and the Spirit came in, but I didn't know all the sin that I had in my life because I didn't know all things that were sin. But I knew I had Jesus Christ and I was saved, and you did too when you got saved. But we had to grow, didn't we? And the way we grew was to have the uh, Spirit of God, uh, luminous, outwardly and internally. He is the light, showing who He is by His whole persona. If you take Jesus at His whole, He represents God, the Father, as the whole. The Spirit of God represents Jesus and the Father as a whole. The whole persona. Uh, was he uh, totally truthful? He absolutely is. Was it possible for him to lie? No, it is not. God can't lie. He only tells the truth, good or bad, uh, for us, but I can tell you, the good has never been anything but good to me. I have found the truth of the Word of God where I was in sin before and, and didn't know. But I was glad to find out that I had been uh, forgiven of all the sin that I had done while I was uh, not a believer. And then after a believer, the things I did that I didn't really want to do or didn't think was sin maybe until I learned it and started to have victory. There's a great joy in that. Uh, the word uh, uh, means uh, lego uh, means um, see if I can put this yeah let me, let me do it this way. Lego would be such as a, a systematic discourse that reveals himself that be Jesus. All right, he had a dis he had a systematic discourse. Well, what is a systematic discourse? Well, um, well, this is because this is the systematic discourse that reveals Jesus, God the Father, and the Spirit to us. When we're indwelled, now we have all this understanding coming to us. Anything we want to know about them, we can find it right here. And it's a systematic thing because it's not a, a just an arbitrary thing or a, something that's a, on the outside that we cannot understand. It is systematic because it reveals everything we need to know about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And, you know, that brings joy to me. I don't know about you, but it brings joy to me because I don't want to be left on the outside. I want to know it all. And if I can know it, I want to know it. And so we study, and that's how what he does. He reveals himself. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and, and of course God. The Gospels reveal Jesus, don't they? And then in the, the epistles, Jesus is revealed. And uh, he's revealed for everything that he is. Starting with his holiness, which is the most, to me, the most important characteristic of God is his holiness. And that's why it's so important to him that we are. All right, that's verse 5. Now, verse 6. Um, verse 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, we are liars if we say we have fellowship uh, with him, with Jesus, God the Father, Holy Spirit, um, and ourselves walk or live in darkness. I mean, you can't have two things. You can't be both things. Now, we make mistakes and sin as believers. We do. Sometimes we allow the uh, flesh to take over. And we do something that we shouldn't do. We say some things that we shouldn't say or whatever it is. But we're not living in darkness. What I'm saying is, is that uh, if I went back to living the life I lived before I was a believer, well, I wouldn't be uh, full of joy. I, I wouldn't be glad that I know Jesus Christ and, and um, uh, I would be living in darkness and, and uh, away from Him and have no fellowship with Him. But praise God, when we sin, and we all do, let's just be honest about it, we all do, not like we did before we were saved, but we all do, on occasion. When we do, what can we do? What's the very next thing you need to do when you realize you've done something that's wrong? There you go. You just come to God and say, I did something, and I sure shouldn't have done it. Forgive me for it. And help me not to do that again. Give me a strength to overcome that thing in my life that works on me. And believe me, He will start to do it. And you will be uh, so full of joy you won't know what to do yourself. So, if we uh, are not like that, if we, we are liars, if we say that we have fellowship with Jesus, but we continue in darkness. Maybe a, it might be an adumbration, uh, a further expression of earlier statements. Now, I was uh, trying to think of that, and, and, and here's how I can explain it. When I was nine years old, I went down front in a church in Corbin, Kentucky. Church, my parents and I and my brothers attended. And I went down front and I wanted to join the church. Well, yes, yes, we will be glad to have you as a member of the church. And I want to be baptized. Oh, yeah, that's all part of it. The only problem was no one told me what it meant to be saved. Now, you can go back to nine years old and track that forward in the life, my life, till I was 37 years old. You understand that sometimes we say things or do things that we have to come back and explain. 
But nobody came back and explained it. I got baptized and they voted me into the church. And I was still a sinner, not saved. And it affected my life for my whole life. Till I was 37 years old. And I think about that every once in a while. And I have joy, you know, now because I'm saved. <coughs> And I don't have to worry about that, but I can tell you, I was angry for a while because nobody took the Bible and showed me how to be saved. Now, so it's a confession maybe of belief um, and fellowship in God's ministry or the contrary, which is common, but also profane, false, where people are making statements about their belief, but they have not an ounce of belief in them. And so their joy is not there. But once somebody takes the word and explains it, they get to come back to that point in time when they should have been saved, but they can come back and say, I made a, I made a mistake. I, there's something happened in my salvation. And today, Lord, I ask you to uh, make that real in my life because there's no joy in life without Christ. And many of these people end up in the common, profane, or false <coughs> as defiled and unholy. And their lives are never changed and they die and go into hell and their joy is nothing. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. And you know, this is a great joy point right there. Verse 7 is a deeper revelation of verse 5. If we're living in his life and displaying uh, his word, that, that, that would be right, wouldn't it? Because we'd be living as light. And what are we? What does the Bible say we are? We are the light of the world. Jesus isn't here. His word's here. His spirit's here. But he's not in every person. So there are many people in the world who are not living in the world in the light because they don't have the light. His word and his actions are not portrayed by them. The systematic discourse that reveals him and purposes through uh, him comes from us comes through us to other people. We are the light of the world. And that's a great joy to me, and I know it is to you. If we agree with Him and with each other in our walk, in other words, we have a, an agreement with each other. We're all believers, and we take the Word as the truth, and we try to live it and we're living together in a church uh, family, and we all support each other, and we all help each other uh, through times of need and times of prosperity. We uh, enjoy each other's prosperity. We have it made when you think of the eternal things of God. If we, uh, uh, we're all uh, displaying that, that light 
and that purpose through us. If we agree with each other uh, in our walk in life, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Not some sin, all sin. Everything that you discover in your life that's sin. And believe me, the Spirit of God will find it if it's sin. You can't sin that the Spirit of God doesn't know it. And He'll convict you most of the time right now. And the best time to confess something is the moment you realize that you've done something wrong. Now, right now, not later. You know, I've, I've, I've said something to people. I had to go uh, get on my knees and beg God to forgive me for what I'd said. And I did it right then. And, um, and it's the best way to do it because now you're free and clear from the guilt. And God takes care of you in that way. To be cleansed from sin, what's it take first to be cleansed of sin? Acknowledge you're a sinner. Huh? Acknowledge you're a sinner. <laughs> That's it. You have to first admit that you are a sinner. <laughs> you know, I didn't do that when I was at nine years old because nobody explained to me about sin and what sin did to me. All I thought I was doing, was, I thought you just joined the church and that was it. All right, look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And, uh, and chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. Uh, no, verse 1. All right, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, having therefore these promises. What promises? Well, dearly beloved, just wanted to let us know that we're his beloved. And he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. God said, I love you. I love you with a love that Sometimes you don't even understand. I, I couldn't understand how much God could love me and forgiven me of my sin when I got saved. I, I, I just, it was just overwhelming to me. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. First off, you have to know you're a sinner. And you have to accept it that you are. And then you begin to transform into what God wants you to be as you uh, accept Him. Uh, chapter 8, verse 11. No, I'm sorry. It's verses 8 through 11 of chapter 7. Now, Paul had written him a letter. You know these are two letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. At the church of Corinth, and Paul wrote them, and he, he wrote them a scathing letter. The first one peeled the hide off of them. And he writes, verse 8, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. He said, For though I made you sorry, I'm not sorry. I had to do it. I've had to say things to people who were in sin who didn't realize it and even when people talk to them they refuse to accept it. I've had to tell them, Look, you're destroying your reputation as a Christian. 
and you need to quit. He said, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle, letter, hath made you sorry, though it were before a season. I, I did, I did, I didn't repent of it. I didn't take that letter back. And I'm sorry I had to do it, but I had to. I didn't have any choice. Have you ever been in a position like that? You, see, right? you had to tell them something that you didn't want to have to tell them how their life was going. Well, I've had my children. I've had several uh, occasions where I had to tell them, you're, you're not going in the right direction. What are you doing? How are you going to go? Are you going to die and go to hell for that? It doesn't always work. But I can tell you, if you're sincere about it, it works in some cases, in some ways, I mean. Now, number, verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but you that you sorrowed to repentance. There's a big, big difference in that, isn't there? Yeah, I've, I've made my people sorry sometimes, and I wasn't sorry I'd done it, but it left them in a sorry condition that they felt like there was no way out. But God doesn't do that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, He provides a way of escape when you're in a sin condition that is beyond your understanding and how you're going to overcome. He provides you a way to come out of that sin. Now, he says, but that you sorrow to repentance. That means they were sorry, doesn't it? Repentance means to be sorrowful. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. You were made sorry None of us was made sorry after a worldly repentance, which is no repentance at all. We were made sorry in our sin in a godly repentance where we said to God, I'm sorry that I am what I am. That you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. I was going this way in life, and when the Word got a hold of my heart, I had to do an about turn. I used to do that in the military, and I can't do it anymore. I had to make an about turn and go back this way. I had to turn from sin and turn to God. And I had to do it in a way that made a difference. That I meant it. And the result was that I, my life was changed. Verse 11. For behold this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sword, what carefulness it worked in you, Yea, what clearance of yourself, I'm no longer guilty. What indignation, I hate sin. Yea, what fear, I don't want to be a sinner who goes back and does things that oppose God. Yea, what vehement desire, I desire, and you maybe have too, to be the best you can be for Christ and for the Father. Yea, what zeal, what revenge. In all things you, ha you have approved yourselves to be clear of this matter. You're saved, and we ought to act like we're saved. We ought to have that joy in our lives. I know we're under the gun now, and it's a tough thing, but listen, it's not going to get any better if we don't have the joy of the world, of the life 
a living Christ and portray that to other people. Now verses 8 through 10, uh, 8 and 10 uh, are together. If we say we don't need to be cleansed because we are not sinners, we deceive ourselves or seduce ourselves into delusions thinking that we are not guilty of sin even though God has declared that we are guilty. Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and miss the mark of glory or purity needed for salvation. You can't save yourself. You'll never be good enough. All you can do is turn your life over to Christ. And this is what we need to tell people. Sir, you're going in the wrong direction. Paul Henry told me the other day, he was talking to a man, and he said, do you know without a shadow of doubt that you will pass into heaven when you die? And the man said, oh, well, I, I'm pretty sure Paul said, pretty sure doesn't cut it. You've got to know it. And the way you know it is to claim it. Claim Jesus Christ and his salvation. And let him turn your life around. And the man said, well, I don't know if I've done that. And Paul said to him, that was the answer I didn't want to hear. What I wanted to hear was, oh yeah, I'm a believer. I live it. Part of my life. Where it is my life. And so, we need to say to people, what will happen to you when you leave this life? Where are you going? And it was going to open up opportunities uh, for talking to people. Now verse 9. This is the last verse. Here's the here's the joy in verse 9. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry but that you sorrow to repentance for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Here is the, uh, the fruit of joy. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now is there joy in that statement? Well, first there is, there's two. To recognize Jesus Christ as the truth. The only, the, the best thing you can do is put aside yourself or talking to people, tell them to put aside themselves and let Jesus Christ be number one in their life and the indwelling spirit and the Father but accept Jesus' sacrifice for your sin and let the Spirit of God come into you and start to transform you. And believe everything that Jesus has said is the truth. Everything that's in this Word is the truth. And secondly, to accept Jesus Christ as the way to salvation. This brings the ultimate joy. It begins the joy, anyway, in life. It's to know you're no longer uh, guilty of sin. You may sin, but you have forgiveness 
of sin through Jesus Christ. And you have understanding of sin uh, through the Spirit, and you also have understanding of how the Spirit works in your life. If you would go home today and read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I, I pray that you will do this. If you have any questions, I want you to write them down. Because I want you to make sure, I want to make sure you understand this. I know you do, I think you do, but I want to make sure of it. Do that. Now, joy, joy is what we all should have. We should all be looking forward to it. Donna's at home sick. Well, she's at home in pain. And uh, I had to put my arms around her today. And say to her, there's joy yet in life. I believe that God will restore you. Well, let me say to you, I believe that God will restore, will restore her to some measure of health that joy will emanate from her like she has been before. Although she does joke and carry on her bed when she's around kids. You know, the bad influence. Anybody have something you'd like to share this morning? Did I capture joy for you? Do you understand joy? Okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, <coughs> let's just uh, pray and uh, we'll be through this morning. If anybody has something you want to talk about, though, or want me to pray for you personally, if you'll come down front after the service, I'd be happy to do that. Or if you have a question that you don't want to ask openly, uh, but you'd like to have an answer, well, I'll try to do that too, okay? Father, I thank you today. I thank you that I can have joy in my heart because I know Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. I know I have forgiveness for sin when I make a mistake in sin or I let myself be drawn away by Satan and say something or do something I shouldn't and, or other things, the flesh. It's a, it's a hard life uh, to live in this life today, in this world. We have to be separated from the world. Help me to be separated and help each one of us together to be separated as a church. It takes all the individuals to separate all the church. And that we might be a testimony to people in the community of how faithful we are to God and how we do things that emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not many of us, but there doesn't take a ton. It just takes us doing what we need to do. And we thank you and we praise you for what you will do. Lift us up and give us your joy Every day, every morning, every night when you lay your head on the pillow, that God would come into you and, or would say to you, um, have joy. Uh, you were obedient today and you showed the world who I am today. And Father, we'll praise you throughout all eternity. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you all.